Happy to be in God's house on a Sunday morning. It's been okay. I'm not happy to be in God's house, but so we're gathered as a family, but then okay, I know that I'm in God's house because I'm in this temple, right? So anyway. God's awesome. Um, I'm excited this morning. Last week um, we got to talk about the gospel and talk about the um, that we have freedom from the penalty of sin. So that we have we no longer have to face the penalty of sin. Jesus took that on himself. He died, which was okay, because it doesn't really give us hope that Jesus died as a penalty of sin. But what gives us hope is that he rose again. So then we have the same hope that in our sins, that sin does not conquer our life, but yet we can conquer his uh, conquer sin over uh, because the Spirit of God lives in us. And so um, today, I made a neat little picture here. I found this really cool site called Canada.com, so I can make neat graphics. And look like I know what I'm doing. But um, <laughs> the gospel power, there's hope. And if you can see it maybe a little bit clearly, it's, uh, it's a hand that's holding on to a rock rock climbing. Has anybody ever been rock climbing before? Cindy, way you go. Cindy like does everything, that's amazing. Um, so rock climbing, you know, we got uh, the hands, you know, that. I was looking for a picture that could like demonstrate, you know, holding on to something. And um, it's like, you know, Google rock climbing hands. And um, when I did that, I just, we saw like all these hands, they're like blistered. Anybody Google search things and you're like, the pictures are like, ah. And so, like, the hands of these guys are just totally blistered, totally, you know, like tore up. Um, and I can just imagine, you know, rock climbing and just like, you know, holding on for dear life, you know, going through all the rock and it was just, uh, everything was, everything was torn and a mess. What is it? Is it me? All right, I'll stop ringing here in a moment. All right, so, but I was, I was thinking about that, just that holding on, holding on to the rock, and what is our rock? So let's uh, turn again, I'm gonna, some of you that have been here over the last few weeks have heard this verse um, multiple times, but it's so important that we continue to talk about the gospel this month, that we, we understand this simple verse, so Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And this morning is going to be a unique opportunity for you guys to hear more of, of my story, of uh, my and Rachel's story, of how the gospel has transformed our life. Why can we have hope in the gospel? Because the, the, we can hope in the gospel because the gospel is our only hope. It's the only thing that can transform us. And when life situations happen, sometimes it's required of us to hold on to the one thing that won't change. And we know that one thing that won't change is who God is and what He's done. It's the gospel. It's good news. So Romans 1, chapter 16, or, yeah, 1, verse 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Last week we talked about the power of God, that the gospel, who He is, what He's done, is His power for us to experience salvation. <coughs> And at the very end, it's really important that we remember it's what we believe. So, who God is and what He does it never changes. Our responsibility as believers is to believe, to have faith in that thing that He says, who He is and what He's done through His revealed Word. And so we hold on to it in situations when things don't um, always go the way we want, uh, when things are in troublesome, our responsibility or our opportunity is to hold on to the truth. Just like a rock climber would onto a rock. So today we're going to be talking about we're being saved from the power of sin. So it was we are saved from the penalty of sin, but we are now being saved from the power of sin. So in our lives we have circumstances as we come to know Jesus. Dad mentioned it really nicely that when I came to know Jesus, I said I put my faith in you and I'm washed clean. And the penalty of sin is removed from my life. But now, as I continue to walk with the Lord, anybody know there's some things in our lives that we continue to do that we don't want to do? Paul says that in Romans, right, chapter 7. He's like, there's sometimes I do things that I don't want to do, and I want to do them, but I don't do them. And he concludes that, thanks be to God, it's through Jesus Christ that I overcome these things. So, as a believer, I am saved. So when I put my faith in Jesus, 
I know that my, I have an internal security because the penalty of sin has been taken care of. But now as I'm walking with him, I'm becoming more and more like the image of God, right? I'm looking more and more like him. Why is it? So let's, let's turn our Bibles to John. Now we're turning to John chapter, uh, chapter 20. John chapter 8. I make that up. John chapter 8, verse 42. It says, John chapter uh, 8, 42 says, But Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own, for God has sent me. So if God is our Father, we love Jesus. So I, there's something in, I think, in all of our lives as we come to Jesus that we desire to be like Jesus. We love Jesus. We love who He is. And we want to be more and more like Him. In John 14, let's turn there a couple chapters later. John 14, verse 15 and 16. It's really important. So if, if we love Jesus, right, if we love me, Keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So if we love Jesus, we will obey his commandments, and he will give us the Holy Spirit, who is going to be our advocate, he's going to help us, and he's going to be with us, he's going to be the Spirit of truth, who is going to guide us in all truth as we come to know him as our Savior. We want to be more and more like him because we fall in love with Jesus. We want to obey his commands. And so I believe in, in my life as I've come and submit my life to Jesus, there's a desire that I have to become more and more like him. There's a desire that I have now that the, the things that I maybe before Christ used to find pleasure in, used to find pleasing to myself, there's a desire in me that I know now that my spirit has been awakened that that is not of me, that's not of God, and so I want, there's a desire that I have to be like God. How many else have that desire to be like God? I want, I want to be like God. I love you, Jesus. And I, I, there's a song that we sing sometimes, just singing back to God. And God, of course, it's awesome to think about His love for me, but then just to sing back to Him, I love you, I desire you. You're, you're something that I put my full attention on. I want to obey your commands. So let's neat in this is in John chapter 20 that I had mentioned earlier. John chapter 20 verses 21 and 22. It says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then he, on verse 22 and 23. And with that, he breathed on us the Holy Spirit, and we received Him. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So Jesus here at the, at the end, as He's returning into heaven, He breathes on the breathes on the disciples the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit again is the Spirit of Truth. It's going to guide us and lead us into all truth. So what happens in our lives when we're not experiencing? The salvation that we have claimed to. So we put our faith in Jesus that He's going to He's going to remove the sins of our lives. That we're going to um, be the penalty of sin is going to be taken from us. Now we're now we're having unity with Him. What happens in the middle of that when we're not experiencing, like Romans one says, that we'll experience salvation, we'll experience freedom. And so in my and Rachel's life, I, we wanted to take time this morning and, and share our testimony. So. Um, Growing up, for me, uh, it was really neat to be growing up in Pastor Bob and Pastor Tina's home. You know, it's like a really awesome place to be. It's been that in Northern, they're pretty cool. I think no, I'll endorse them. Um, but I went off to I went off to um, Iowa College, and because of my relationship with the Father, knowing that I read His Word, and even going off to Bible College, you would, you go and you study all day long different scriptures and different things, and so. I had gained a lot of knowledge of who God was. 
I could, I could preach a neat sermon and be like, okay, this is who God is, this is what he's done, just like I did a few weeks ago, but I didn't, I had not <coughs> known these truths. There's a difference between a knowledge of him, okay, I, I can quote these scriptures, or maybe some of you guys are uh, dealing with math or doing, dealing with different sciences, you can like, okay, I know these things, but then there's, there's when it becomes real to you, so you're out on a job and now you have, you have to apply what you already know, right? So then in my life, there's scriptures that I've read, and okay, I've known about who he was, but I didn't apply them to my life. I didn't like little, uh, learn how, to, how they affected everyday life. And so I found myself um, off in college and really began to ex um, experience that I, I didn't know God. My life had begin, um, begun to unfold in a way that I was experiencing what I would call just the same as what a, a life of an unbeliever. So one of the key things in my life, uh, as, okay, sorry, let me back up for two seconds. The spirit of truth reveals to us the truth, right? And so as he reveals to us the truth, our opportunity now is to believe on the truth. So there's times in our lives, even after coming to Jesus, that lies have been spoken to, into our lives where we begin to believe on lies and they affect how we live, right? So if, the, the, if we believe on the truth, if we believe on the gospel, it's a power of God for salvation. If we have lies that exist in our heart, then those lies will be what we live out instead of the truth of God. And our opportunity is to now believe on the truth that the Holy Spirit continues to reveal to us. So one that I, um, one that affected my life in a deep way was uh, a fear of man. So we know that in Jesus, we've talked about this, that God is our Father. So we have been completely accepted by the Father. So we are His children, we're His sons. We, we talk about we're now placed in, as heirs to the throne. We're on equal playing field with Jesus. We're, it, we stand before God just as if we've never sinned. We're completely accepted. But sometimes in life, situations happen where we begin to believe a, a, a lie, a, believe a false uh, truth. For me in my life, one of the biggest things was that I was not accepted. So I, I believe that um, they, were, they that authority. If I came to authority and I shared something that was on my heart, that the authority would reject me no matter what, you know, no matter what my thought. I I feared um, acceptance from those who were around me. So I'd always try to fit in, but I knew I couldn't fit in with the other guys because maybe they were interested in different things, and so I. I have this fear that I would be rejected if I showed somebody who I really was, what was really going on in my heart. This affected not only just my relationship with people around me, but also um, specifically my uh, what I viewed about God. So the lies we believe in our everyday life don't just affect, um, aren't just what we see in our in our everyday reactions. But they're actually lies that we believe about who God is and what He's done. So because I believe that I couldn't be my real self before God, I couldn't show him everything that was in my heart, and that he wouldn't completely accept me, then as I interacted with believers um, in school or, you know, authorities in my uh, in the college, that I was afraid to show them what was really going on in my heart. Well, why did, why was this such a, a terrible thing? Like, okay, well, you know, I, I can be a, you can be a private person. That's a good thing, Andrew, that you don't you know, share and spill every, all your guts with everybody, you know? It's, it's all right. And, however, then when I found that this lie began to be pervasive as I, as I turned away from the, oh, turned away from truth. So, Rich and I um, have a really sweet, awesome testimony now where we can stand on the other side of this and say, God did it, something awesome. But the things that I, that we'll talk about this morning are, uh, you know, like, like are really like they were real to us, like they really happened. Um, and sometimes it's crazy for me to talk about them. But um, for Rachel and I going off to Bible college, one of the awesome things is, hey, one day I'll be a minister, and this is going to be neat. I get my little certificate in the mail that says, you know, Andrew Castro got a license. You know, it's really really neat, right? And, and like I said, this this issue of acceptance began to pop up as Rachel and I see this awesome woman, really beautiful, and, and worshiping God and everything, I'm like, she's the one I want to marry, right? Like, I'm, I'm going to make sure I get a ring on this, like, really quick. We have the, after, uh, after sophomore year, uh, 
actually, in between this freshman year and sophomore year, we got engaged to get married. This is really exciting, really exciting, we'll go get married. And, but we found ourselves, even after we got, now we have marriage on our, you know, radar, hey, we're going to be together forever, and found ourselves, you know, compromising in our purity with one another. And it was like, so, like, this is a, a big deal for me, growing up in the church, knowing all this thing, knowing that I'm at a, at a Bible college, preparing to be a minister, and compromising in my life in such a, such a crazy fashion. So, bring in this lie that, okay, I'm not accepted, I, uh, the Father in heaven, I can't come before him and tell him what's going on, even though he already knows. How many have, anyway, I want to say, raise hand, but how many have believed that before him? I can't even tell God what I'm doing because uh, I don't want him to know. The Father knows all things about our lives, right? I was, so it affected, one, my relationship with the Father, so I wasn't able to go to him and, and, and tell him everything in my heart, the things that are going on in my, in my life. But it affected then, it began to affect now in school. Now I can't even, I can't even go and get help to anybody because what if I told them what was actually going on, then they kicked me out of school, then I, would, then, they, then I would never be able to be a minister, my whole life would be a mess. You ever been in those moments where the enemy uh, begins to speak to you more than what the truth that you know? Then Jesus says this, that the enemy has a native tongue, and his native tongue is lying. That's all he does. The, the enemy is the accuser of the brother. He's there to accuse you, to speak to you lies. And so that's why it's so important to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, to know who God is and what he's done in his word, because then in times of accusation, when the enemy speaks those lies, we so know the truth that we can count, we can, we can, we can, through the Holy Spirit, identify the lies that are being spoken to me. But as I'm walking, I'm walking this out in my life, and now I'm afraid to tell my parents what's going on. I, I don't want to tell the Father in Heaven what's going on. I don't want to tell the administration who's there to help me and guide me in this time what's going on. And so now I'm, I find that my life is hidden in darkness. We're perpetually going through things. And then, and then on top of that, we decide, okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and get married and, and everything. And so our whole relationship then as a married couple was had the foundation not of truth and, and holiness and righteousness and things of, of the gospel, but now have a foundation of lies that we believe about who God is. And it affect it begin to affect every area of life. So I wanted to invite Rachel up too. We're going to kind of tag team. We haven't um, done this in a little while. And uh, we did it in May. So um, but we want I wanted Rachel to share. What are what are some what were some of the lies uh, that she was believing and how it affected um, her life? Things that she was going through. Okay. So I grew up in a Christian family as well, and I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and I went to Bible college to meet this handsome man that I married. Um, but I have a lot of health issues, and I have internal bleeding, and I got diagnosed with prematurely ovarian failure. And so I thought that I was like done with it. Like I thought that God healed me, I believed it. And then I had another bleeding episode while I was in school. And then I started to get angry. I was angry with my body, that it wasn't working the way that it was supposed to be working. I was starting to get angry with God because he's the one that created me this way. So I thought. And then, um, so then we knew well, I knew that I was going to have a hard time getting pregnant whenever it came time. So when we first got married, we went to the doctor just to see in the future if we were to get pregnant, what were the procedures that we needed to do. So then we did some testing, and then the, the doctor came back to me and said, um, I'm sorry to say this, but you have a 0% chance to get pregnant. And that was like within our first year of marriage. So it was like... The foundation of believing that God doesn't care about me, God doesn't love me, God doesn't want to heal me, God is like this evil man that I thought, and that I had a hard view of my father. My father was hardly ever around. He was a workaholic. Um, and then viewing God that same way, that God did not want to be with me. God did not care about me whatsoever. And so then when we get married, 
we found out they can't get pregnant, I became very depressed. Um, probably more depressed than what I, I probably went in that depression growing up for a various of reasons. And then, um, so I was starting to believe that I wasn't enough at all. So I inter, inter, inter what's that word? Internalized. Thank you. Internalized um, my feelings. That I can't share my feelings with anybody. I can't share my feelings with my husband because what is he going to think of me? Because that's like in our society, that's the next step. You go to college, you get married, you have family, you get kids, and I can't do that for my family. And so I was like ashamed. And then, so I uh, got very depressed. And every single time I would try to deal with not being able to get pregnant, we were in the ministry and it's like, well, I have to put a front up because I can't let our people know what's going on in my hair because then they wouldn't accept me. And then I can't really share with God what's going on in my heart because he just doesn't care about me. He's off in a distance and doesn't care about Rachel whatsoever. And then um, we actually finally made it to Purdue University. And that's when life completely changed. That's when our marriage completely changed. Um, oh, sorry. Next, next. <laughs> so my view of God was not correct. It was incorrect. So life, like, um, I'll use this now. All right. So, All right. Like, so, so life. When we, when we're walking through God, when we're walking through life, when the enemy, what the enemy desires for our life is for destruction. So, you know, uh, this week I got to share with, um, share with one of the guys in the church, just you know, all the raw details in our life, and I said. No, I, I haven't. I haven't shared this as a with the church. We haven't shared this with our family to, because when I when we say the gospel gives us hope, we have hope in the gospel. There's one aspect of it where we're like, okay, of course, yeah. One day, uh, the, the the trumpets will sound, right? We'll rise with the Lord, and everything will be great because we'll be in the presence of God. But the, in the here and now situation, what we realized in our lives was. Because of the way the enemy had begun to speak lies to us in the way, because we had begun to believe those lies over the truth of God, our life experience was not the peace of God. It wasn't the comfort of God. It wasn't the fact that God was in control. Our life was in chaos. You know, as we begin to tell even even more details in our in our life and in our home, there was no peace, zero peace. There was uh, if, if talk about me always now fearing men and fearing their opinions of me. Rachel would, you know, ask me a request, and as a, as a good, loving husband, I thought, okay, well, I should do everything my wife wants me to do. You know, so I'm, I'm here, you know, I work the job, and I'm in school, trying my, my best to be, to Rachel, everything that I thought I had uh, this image of what a husband should be like. So I'm, I'm trying to do everything for Rachel, meet her every need. Rachel's struggling with, okay, now God, he isn't a loving God, because if God was a loving God, then he would have healed me, he would have taken these things. You know, her life is out of control. It, nothing that, nothing that um, in her life she could control. So these illnesses and things, the doctor just came with a new diagnosis after new diagnosis. Now her life is getting out of control. So she was trying to take control of things. Okay, so now since, you know, if God's not in control and I can't trust him with my life, now I'm going to try to control every little aspect of my life. I'm going to get angry when things don't go right. I'm going to, you know, we're, we have, you know, great... I mean, I know nobody else does this, but great yelling battles in the home and different things like that. It was all based off of, not because of, uh, you know, what people used to say is, oh, you guys are just newlyweds. You know, one day you'll grow out of it, right? But I believe every issue of sin in our life, every issue where we are not experiencing the salvation, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit in our life, is based not on, okay, newlyweds, or oh, it's a new experience, or oh, I'm, I'm dealing with stress, or I'm dealing with this. It's based on Romans 1, 16. We're not believing the truth. We're not believing the gospel, and so we don't experience salvation. So in all of this, we're going to different, we started to go to different people for advice. I don't know, maybe you guys have, yeah, maybe you guys have experienced that. So okay, I, I need to go to a pastor and ask them what's going on, or I need to, you know, maybe there's a mature person in the body, I need to, uh, you know, ask them. So, so there was, um, I was at CBC, there was a time where I was like, okay, well, I, 
this is so miserable. There's zero peace in our home. I've got to get some kind of help. And so I went to somebody and uh, went, went to actually one of the, the like the counseling department and I said, hey, you know, this is what's going on in our marriage. I need help. And he's like, sorry, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Great, you know, that's wonderful. I said, okay, well, I guess I just decided in my life that, uh, I was like, okay, well, I feared God enough that I said, well, you know, if I'm honest, I said, I couldn't divorce Rachel because I know that one's in Scripture, and I just, I, I'm going to hold on to at least that. So I'm like, so I've got my little hand, like, that's my only, I'm like, okay, that's the only thing I just got to suffer for the rest of my life. Like, honestly. I don't know if you guys are in, have been in that situation where, where things begin to look, the lies begin to look so true that now it breeds hopelessness in your life. We got to a place of, of holiness where the lies begin to be so true. This is never going to change. We're just going to be stuck like this forever. We had you know, dreams of what, what we thought God wanted us to do in our life. We had, we had you know, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to go to these places. All these awesome things are going to happen. And we're stuck in the middle of this. And we said, it's, it's hopeless. You know, thoughts of death and suicide were, were like so real in our life because now they... The, the, yeah, the false, the false lies of the enemy have become so real in our life. Everything we experienced was, was false. So what did we do? We were like just hopeless. We uh, went down to Florida State, did an internship down there, and, and asked the pastor down there. And he been like, hey, what, you know, what can we do? What could happen? And he goes, well, just give Rachel a baby. I'm like, I don't know if that, I don't, I don't, I'm looking, I'm like, I, that just doesn't sound right either, you know, I'm just, you know, I wouldn't want to raise a child in a, in a, in a home that was just miserable, right? Yeah, it was miserable. So we, so we were just praying, and um, one of the things for me in, in, in my heart is when I was young, God, God, through the Word and through other people, I, I really was convinced that God wanted me to do a, be in ministry for full time. And as we're going through this journey, one of the things that, you know, probably made me most hopeless or most depressed, you know, in my heart, was the fact that, okay, if, if our marriage is never um, solid, then, you know, I could never do what God wanted me to do. So I had this, like, expectation that I put on my life that, hey, I'll be this awesome, amazing person, you know, doing ministry and all these kind of things. But now the reality is I can't do it, and that bred hopelessness in, in, my, in my heart, too. And so we finally get to a place where we're at the view. A really neat thing happened there, where we we met a woman. Her name's Linda. She leads the ministry there, and uh, her life was transformed. She lived a life um, as a transgender person for uh, growing up, and then God um, radically changed her life when she began to believe in truth about God and began to investigate where in her heart she was believing these lies. And now she's an awesome woman of God who's preaching and proclaiming the truth. And so. But we get to her, and immediately she goes, there's something off with you two. <laughs> like, maybe. You know, I'm still dealing with this fear of man. I don't, want, I don't know if it's okay for me to tell people what's actually going on in my heart. I don't know what's, what's happening. And she's, oh, there's something going on. So we begin to just share with her all of, the, all of these issues in our lives. See, we, we are being saved. From the power of sin, there is hope, and I was, and we were at a place where like this looks completely hopeless. But we begin to identify in our heart where are the lies that we're believing about God. See, every issue of sin, every issue where we're not experiencing the truth about God, is an issue of belief in our heart. And so we begin to think about this, like, what are what are what are these areas of unbelief? that we're believing, that's causing this ugly, nasty fruit in our lives. No peace, no comfort, no love for one another. Something that I begin to believe, you know, yeah, so I'm going to invite Rachel up before I begin to say the next thing. I'm going to invite Rachel up and her to begin to tell some of the areas that God showed her what she was, what she was believing about Him and how that was affecting everyday life. 
So as they were at Purdue, um, Linda and Andrew were praying behind the scenes about me going to counseling because of the way I grew up and the whole dealing with the health issues and dealing with not being able to get pregnant and not having a family. And um, so they were praying really hard behind the scenes because my parents would look at me and say, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to send you to counseling. And so I had a wrong view of counseling. And so um, I uh, was like, okay, if I'm really going to pursue Jesus and have the right view of who Jesus is and who the Father is, I'm going to have to go to counseling. So I came to terms with, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So I took a part-time job at a daycare. I've been in daycare since I was 16, worked with children since I was 12. Um, so I knew I was like, okay, I'm good at that, so I can do that. And then um, started to go to counseling, and then they had a spring break trip in Illinois um, at one of the Chi Alpha ministers there. And I stayed back because I had just gotten a job, and I couldn't just ask off right away. And I was sitting in my room, sitting on our bed, and spending time with Jesus. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to spend time with him to know what, what is going on in my heart. And as I was spending time with him, he was just revealing that, like, I'm trying to be perfect. And I, I can't be perfect without Jesus. Jesus is the only one in me that can make me perfect. And... Um, and performance oriented, like I was trying to perform and earn God's love and earn Andrew's love and earn my parents' love. But then God was telling me that like, no, that's not right. You don't have to earn anything. Because in the Bible, it was, and there's a story of um, John the Baptist and Jesus. And Jesus was like, John, you have to baptize me. And John's like, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> that's not my job. And he's like, no. For you to fulfill what the word of God wants me to do, you have to baptize me. So then Jesus gets baptized and the heavens open up and um, remind you that Jesus did no ministry whatsoever. He didn't do anything. And God opened the heavens and said, this is my son who I am well pleased. So for God to say that about Jesus, that he did nothing, then Jesus was telling me that I don't have to do anything for him to love me. And so uh, I, I realized during spring break when I was home and he was away, I needed to take time out of the ministry to really pursue all these lives that I've been combating with of who God was and what he's done and, and who I am and the way he created me. And um, so now we're on the other other side of that but I had to be the one to say okay enough is enough because I know that I need that relationship with Jesus if I'm going to make it in this world I need that relationship with Jesus if our marriage is going to work and so like once I realized the root of being a perfectionist and having the root of knowing why I'm being performance and trying to earn love and the father was just like, just like, as soon as I realized that and I had like the wrong view of God, it was like overnight it shifted in our home. No joke. Like, it's great that it happened that way. It doesn't always happen that way. But it happened for us where, like, as soon as I identified those lies and I immediately repented and went to my counselor and I, and I don't cry very often. So when I cried in counseling sessions, she was like, that's a good session. <laughs> she was like giving me tissues. It's okay to cry because I believe that it was wrong to cry. My father would say, "If you're gonna cry, I'm gonna give you something to cry about." And so, um, if crying was not allowed in my house, and um, showing God my emotions was, I felt was not okay. But He was beginning to tell me throughout the time, "It's okay. It's okay. It's okay." And so. Is there anything else you want to say? This is totally different than what we normally do on Sunday, but um, you know, one of the things, one of the things in, in my heart that I uh, that began that God began to reveal to me 
was that I was trying to be to Rachel what only he can be. That's all right. That's good. That's how I married you. <laughs> but for me, so I, so I was trying to meet Rachel's every need. But we know that, and when we think about the gospel, that that Jesus is the one that can satisfy our every desire. Right? He goes to the woman at the well, and she's um, has this interaction at the well, and she's asked her for a cup of water, and she's like. Yeah, and then and then she says, "Well, if you knew who was asking for a cup of water, you would ask me, and I would give you water that would be eternal water that would satisfy every desire." And he kind of talks to her even further and says, "Yeah, you you like have go get your husband." And she's like, "Well, I don't have a husband." And he's like, "Yeah, you have a whole bunch of them, you know. And the one you're currently with isn't even your husband." And it, and in that story, we see that Jesus is speaking to her and specifically going after her desires that. Hey, you're desiring after all these things to satisfy you, but only I can. And so in our relationship, I found that I was trying to meet Rachel's every single need, everything she could, every, if she was sad, then I was trying to make her joyful. If, I, if she was in, um, in pain, I was trying to relieve pain. A anything that she was. And so on that, it put on me all this pressure to be in the place of God. And I begin, God began to reveal to me during this time that Andrew, you, you're believing a lie that you're supposed to be the one that meets Rachel's every need. And he says, Andrew, allow me to meet her needs. I'm like, come on, but yeah, that's like so like that's like fairy tale, right? Anybody you guys like read the read the scripture and you're like, yeah, well, that seemed like so off. So off in the distance. Like that's that doesn't seem real. Like I have a, a real need that's currently right here in front of me. There's no peace in my home. I've got to do something about it. And then God says to us, our responsibility is to do nothing. But to believe, I know for as me and I'm just I'll just confess right as me as God is probably some of the hardest things to do to do nothing when things are out of order. I'm like no, I gotta do everything. <coughs> and God began to ask me, you know, over over some time was, Andrew, do you trust me? And I'm like, I mean, of course, right? I could do a sermon on trusting God. That's great, you know, right? I like, I could do I could read a little devotion and tell you where you know. But he said, no, Andrew, do you trust me? Do you really trust me in all these areas of your life? And I'm like, finally, I remember the, uh, for Rachel, the moment where she was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm totally accepted by God and he loves me. For me, it was God asking me, Andrew, do you really trust me? Do you believe that I'm able to do what I said I could do? And it was a moment that when Rachel was in the midst of her, uh, you know, maybe lowest points in depression, which, even coming to church was like this anxiety-filled thing, you know, and me as a, you know, Christian home, I'm like, well, we've got to go to church. Like, the church is the best place for you, Rachel. Like, come on. Like, why not be around the people of God, worshiping God, hearing great sermons? You know, like, let's go to church, you know, and so we're in the middle of church, and, you know, anxiety would hit, and we just say, hey, i got to go home. No, like, stay here. And I would say that, you know, like, I don't know how many times we used to do that. And I was like, no, just stay here, you know. And Rachel's like, okay, I'll straighten up, I'll stay here, you know. <laughs> and uh, one moment, one of the days, she asks, and, and he goes, and the Holy Spirit asks me, he says, Andrew, do you trust me? No, I mean, like, yes. Like, I, you know, immediately your response, of course, when, when you hear the truth, when you hear the voice of God, it's always yes. It's always like yes. It always sounds better than what you're believing, right? Yes, I trust you, of course. And he said, okay, then let her go. I'm like, no, I mean, I trust her when she's in the church with everybody, you know? Like, that's when I trust you. Like, this plays this in my way and how I designed it, right? Where I have control over everything, too, you know? And he said, no, just let her go. And I said, okay. And I said, yeah, Rachel, go ahead and go home. Get two, two cars. So she went, she went home from church. I'm like, this is... This is terrible. This is not what I would preach on a Sunday morning. This is what it would be what I encourage people, you know, in, in discipleship to do. Go home from church. Who does that? And he said, just trust me. Because for me, it was it was truly believing. So I, I, there's something I would say and things like that, that the Holy Spirit can speak to any person. And the Holy Spirit is one that draws people to the Father, right? But yet I wasn't allowing him to draw Rachel to himself. I was like, I wanted to be in the picture. I wanted to be in control. I wanted to help the situation. I want to make everything better. And God said, no, just trust me. So then he went on to Jesus. You know, the Father went on to a lot of different things in our lives to demonstrate again, Andrew, you can trust me. 
one of the biggest one of the biggest breakthroughs in our lives was last uh, last two years ago now um, summer I went to Nicaragua for a mission trip so I'm like thousands of miles away from my loving spouse and right before I was about to leave um, she said Andrew I, I'll tell it oh I was going to say we were on the other side of the mountain at that point where everything shifted in our home we were loving each other the way that God intended to be our view of God was changing so it's like we had a major breakthrough and so I felt like God was just asking us at that time that he's about to share is like a testing of do we truly trust him and who he is and what he can do in us and you have a mic right there oh uh, my, uh, my god so um so one of the things so one of the things that uh i'm you know thousands of miles away in nicaragua and um, i'm thousands of miles away in nicaragua and rachel says hey i want to have i want to go to the doctor while you're gone Okay, cool. You can go with the doctor. That's great. But then she's like, "And we're going to do blood work while I'm gone." I'm like, "No, you can't do blood." You know, in, inside of me, I'm like, I have, this, "I have this conversation." And I'm like, and "Everything within me said, no, like, don't do it. Don't go to the doctor while I'm gone. <laughs> they're going to find out something." And I'm like, "Okay, wait. They're going to find out whether they're, they're here." Okay. So the Holy Spirit said again, this whisper, "Andrew, do you trust me?" Okay, so I let her go to so I go to Nicaragua and let her go to the doctor. Sure enough, I'm in Nicaragua. Like there's this huge rainstorm that comes. You know, like it was really dramatic, kind of like a movie scene. This huge rainstorm comes, there's flash floods everywhere, and I get the phone call. And it's from Rachel. And I'm like, I knew, like, I knew what she was gonna tell me. Hey, I'm hospitalizing. My hemoglobin levels down to a five something and and uh, I need blood transfusion. And that's exactly the conversation we have, right? In the middle of this thing, a thousand miles away. And again, that voice says, Andrew, do you trust me? Okay, of course. Yeah. Trust me. I can't do anything about it anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go all the way. <laughs> the same thing that Rachel's speaking to, reinforcing in Rachel's life, the same thing. Rachel, do you trust me that when Andrew's gone and doing all whatever that he does, that, that, that God is going to be all that she needs in those moments? trust me. A few months later after that, we the medical bill, crazy medical bill. You know, then, then Rachel, on top of that, Rachel gets in a car accident on I-65, which is basically like a, you know, 94 here. You know, going and she rear and somebody totals the car, her and all the passengers walk away, we're like, oh, this is terrible. Now another, you know, another bill on top of this. Then, crazy thing, we get a letter of mail, debts reduced from the hospital, the car that she had was an 03 Saturn Ion with over 150,000 miles on it. I mean, it was worth, I think, $1,000. And they ended up giving us a check for $5,000, paid off all of our medical bills. Then, like, the day after, two days after the accident, um, somebody calls us and says, hey, do you want a, a, a car? And we're like, yeah, but we don't have any money for the car. They said, that's okay, we want to buy you a 2008 Honda Civic Hybrid worth, you know, like $13,000. We're like, cool. And all, and like, all this thing, though, the whole time, God is asking us, do you trust me? Do you believe the truth about who I am? That I care about you, that I am your provider, that I'm in control when things look totally chaotic in your life, that I'm in control. Do you believe this? Why can we believe these things? Because we look at who Jesus is and what he's done, and we say, I can believe on this. If you did it for Jesus, you're doing it in me. I can have faith, I can put my hope in this, because when Jesus, when everything looked out of control in Jesus' life, when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he dies and he's put in the grave, the plan of God looks like it's destroyed. It looks like it looks like it's at the end. It looks like there's no hope, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like in my life, I can say I got to a place where it, it was, it seemed hopeless. Like thoughts of death was a regular thing. That I thought the only way that I would get out of this situation was if I were to die, or if, you know, God forbid that I would even we might not put this on the video, but I might even kill Rachel. Like, those thoughts were real in my life. Like, when you talk about hopeless, I, I was hopeless. There was nothing that I seen right other than the fact that I could cling on to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, I don't know, I don't even know, I don't even have hope, Jesus, that you'll get me through this or that it will change. I just know that I have to cling on to you. And this, uh, you know, I, we've talked about all these awesome things, and maybe I'm not, maybe it's not so much preaching as just 
sharing life with you guys, but I say all this to say this morning that there's hope in Jesus when you cling to Him. Amen. Yeah. Like, don't let the hopelessness of your life and different, the different things that you go through speak louder than the voice of truth in your life. Because the enemy, he only speaks lies. And when we listen to, to, to that voice, you know, we, there's opportunities that we have in life to listen to all sorts of voices. We listen to ourselves, listen to the news, we listen to social media, we got uh, parents, we got family members saying different things, we got uh, hopefully the voice of truth is speaking to us, right? And the enemy is always going to be speaking to us because his, his, his thoughts towards us, he wants to destroy us. And that's something that we experience in such a real way. That everything I knew, I wasn't experiencing because I wasn't taking time to believe the truth. God, you're in control. I can trust you. Why? Because you demonstrated that in Jesus. And if you did it for Jesus, I know you're going to do it for me because now if I put my faith in him, right, I'm co heirs with Jesus. I'm like, we're like, as God looks at us and he sees us just like Jesus. So Ephesians 1, I want to close with this. Uh, Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 20. There's, there's power in the gospel to save us from the power of sin in our lives. Sin, the lies of the enemy, so controlled who we were, what we did, how our life was at peace in our home, uh, how it interacted with people outside of the home. So controlled who I was. But, in the gospel, when I believed on the truth of who God was, we begin to experience the fruit of the Spirit. And peace, and joy, and happiness, and like, whoa, now we can, now when we're interacting as husband and wife, we can challenge each other not to lean on each other more, because, hey, if she leans on me or I lean on her, we're only going to get each other. But when we look to the Father, when we look to Him to receive from Him, then everything in our life is in order. Then we love each other more because, hey, I'm not depending on Rachel. When Rachel, uh, when Rachel fails me or when I fail Rachel, then, hey, it's all right. There's forgiveness because we, we are going to fail each other. But we know that the Father will never fail us. So when our faith and our direction is pointed on Him, then our life is in order. Ephesians chapter 18. This is my prayer for you guys today. This is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, Ephesians church. It says this. I pray that your eye, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incredibly great power. This is the same verse, the same, this is written in the same way that Romans 1.16 was. And his incredible great power for us who believe. That he has great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. For those who believe, we will experience salvation. Romans 1.16 For thus, those who believe, who put our trust in, who put our faith in, who built our lives on, the truth of who God is and what He's done, His great power is going to be demonstrated in our lives. We no longer have to be hopeless because of the gospel. So this morning as I close, I wanted to encourage us. I don't know if you, even in your life, you yourself hanging on the side of a cliff like that. And you're like, I don't know how else I'm going to hold on, but I'm going to hold on to the truth. And I want to encourage you, just as Paul encouraged the church, I want to encourage you that there is great power that God wants to demonstrate in your life to free you from whatever you're going through because this is a process. We are saved from the penalty of sin and we are being saved. That means in the midst of our current things that we're going through, there is power. There's power. There's hope. This morning I want to pray over you as we close, that you will experience the truth of God in a powerful way that's going to change what you're going through, change your experience. So, before I say that, I want to say this one maybe disclaimer, right? So something that 
in the Rachel and I's life, we cling to the truth of God's word, who he is and what he's done. I want to cling to this. Now sometimes, in some circumstances, our, yeah, what we're going through around us didn't change. So Rachel still, we still have health issues that we're going through. There's still finances to be paid off, things of that nature. But now that I, now that we say we believe, you know, we're putting our faith completely on this, who God is and what He's done, in the midst of these crazy, chaotic things that are going on, there's still a foundation that we have in Him, right? So we have strength. Now, you know, we talk about, okay, we experience salvation, and then, then we say, okay, well then everything around me is going to change, and it's all going to be rosy. Well, sometimes the, all around us is still in rosy, right? We're still living life. There's still sin, there's still enemy, right? But in the midst of that, I hold to the Word, and now I experience salvation. Salvation is something I experience within me that brings the joy that I have, the peace that I have, the, um, it's all, it's all within me. So now in the, the chaos is still going on, oh, Okay, the doctor gave us another bad report. That's all right. I know that my God is a healer. He's, he's, he's protecting me and he's going to give me life. Right? So I have that. I believe on that truth. And so even though the circumstance around me doesn't change, my belief in God is solid and strong. My faith is in Him. So then I know as I walk through this, okay, another bad report from the doctor. That's all right. I know my God is with me. He's, he is my healer. Okay, another bad report. That's right. God is my healer. I put my faith in what the Word says, not what my circumstances say around me. Now I can still say, yeah, I'm sick, right? I can still say that. I still experience that. But in the middle of that, I know God is my healer. He's never going to change. His Word never changes. Who He is and what He's done never changes. So we can experience still that joy and that peace in the middle of things because our faith has not been put in the Word and who He is, what He's done, and the Gospel. There's hope. We can put our faith. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you. Father, I thank you for the awesome way that you transformed my life. That you led me uh, to repentance. You led me to believe the truth about who you are. And God, now Rachel and I are experiencing a whole new world, something that's amazing. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room this morning. And I, I ask, God, that your power be made known to them. Father, that uh, wherever they lie, the, the enemy may be speaking lies, even in this moment. Father, I pray that the lies of the enemy would be silent. And Father, that your spirit, the spirit of truth, would begin to speak truth into our hearts. Father, I, I thank you that we can ask you, and Father, Lord, that you give us grace. You help us believe the truth. Just as the Father who brought his son who was demon possessed to you and, and he asked you he said help my unbelief Father I pray for everyone in this room this morning that may be dealing with unbelief where the lies of the enemy are so real in their life they're having a hard time seeing the truth of who you are Father I pray that faith would arise in their heart no matter what it is Father Lord I pray faith would arise and they would believe on you above everything else and that in the midst of their trial, in the midst of their struggle, in the midst of the life of uh, going through life, they would begin to experience you. Because we have you to cling to. You are our rock. Who you are, what you've done, the gospel is awesome news. We cling to that. You are our hope. And Father, I thank you that when we put our hope in you, Father, you never fail us. You never fail us. That's such good news. That encourages my heart this morning. That you never fail us. Jesus, I pray that you would be at work in our lives. 